E ala ua au maal maal mau a hele ka naka ai luna ua kai o koha kula ka hoa kali. Nau i hoa i kau puava puava uli puava kea moa kane moa hini mai kina kau lele kalani. O au ke li uli ue kea ka o kea kano i mai taiti tu o taiti moi. Mai taiti tapa tapu a kane. E i mai ka pule ka oe haa kea kua. Nai nai au e te atua. E ula no ue e te hopo a tane e a ta mauli ola. E ola hoi o mauli ola, e ola ia o e tāne tu me lono, oia, ho oia, e ola. O ke e kāne hua vai a kua kena, o kalina a ka vai ho, o ulua e o ka huli o ka uo uo ho nua. O pai a i ke au au ka mana wa e au lo lo atapo, o piha, o piha, piha, o piha u, o piha, piha e, piha o te to o ho nua, pa ai kalani. O leva te au ia kumuli po ka po. Po no, ai anu ai mekia loha, Velina. A loha mai kako, a wau ne o a kleko a kael a hikeki papa noho inoki e mokupuni o Maui a kauhan noho ihe polopeka noho e makia kula ne Maui a e nae a nui ko mahalo e kapoe na ne ho keli ne ke papa hana. Oi hoi, o ke poe o ho kahua, malalo ke a polo kalamu, ke papahana o ke kaulike. No leila, mahalo ya Aubrey, me ka imi ma, me ka poe o ho kahua. O la ko la ka poe nana i ho ma kaukau, ho la la, ho keli ke papahana nei no kako, ke yala, no leila. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Kalei Koa Kaeo and I'm the... Moderator, I guess, for today's uh, uh, very prestigious panel. And I'd like to uh, really, first of all, mahalo, uh, Aubrey and Kaimi and the whole gang of Ho'okahua uh, from our um, Hawaiian Studies Lab that we have in Kalama 202, the whole gang that works up there, uh, including all the sound people and sound techs who also help to put this together every year. Um, <coughs> in addition, we thank our Kekaulike um, grant that we have which helps to fund some of this to bring and to rent a space here, uh, which is a partnership grant with the University of Hawaii, sorry, University of Hawaii Manoa at the Native Hawaiian Student Services Program. Um, and so today, I first of all, I'd like to thank our two guests for coming and flying in, both from the island of Oahu. To my far right is a faculty in the Hawaiian language department, Kawai Huilani, Hawaii Nui Akea, and uh, she's also our favorite chancellor at uh, Kula Nui or Puhuluhulu, which is our Puhuluhulu University that you have, of course, on the slopes of Mauna Kea. And this is Presley Peke Amuk Sang, uh, and I'd like to mahalo her for coming and sharing her thoughts uh, specifically about Mauna Kea. And you know, I'd like to hear more from her to talk really about her work, what we call the University of Puhuluhulu, uh, which has been a kind of cornerstone in educating our Lahui and all those Kia'i and other visitors who go to the Mauna in support of Mauna Kea. And next to her, to my right, is a, a real close brother of mine, actually, uh, we have spent many years together, actually as students, way back when at the University of Hawaii. Um, and he is also currently a, um, and actually let me just share a little bit about working with Kekai. Uh, we actually, um, in many ways, a uh, lot of political and cultural work in various uh, organizations. But he was once, uh, in fact, an uh, important leader of our uh, Native Hawaiian Student Liberation Union at the University of Hawaii when we were young pups back then at, at the University of Hawaii Manoa, and that was Make'e Pono Lahui Hawaii. Um, and currently he's actually um, an associate professor in the Hawaiian Studies Program um, in Hawaii Nui Akea at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And this is my, my good friend, Wendell Kekailoa Perry. No leila, mahalo. Mahalo to both of them for joining us today to come and share um, a little bit about um, their thoughts, uh, connections, and a history of, of Mauna Kea. And so I'm just going to start off real simple, and I'm going to ask, um, maybe start off with Presley, 
Kialo uh, Anuhea, to share a little bit maybe about uh, your work, first of all, who you are, your work, your professional work, number one. And then secondly, maybe we can get right into um, um, how you got involved perhaps with this current uh, struggle with the protection of Mauna Kea and you know, maybe get right into your work as the, as we call our beloved chancellor mm -hmm. of Puhulu Hulu University. So we can start off with Kiala Anuhea. Yay. Aloha. Aloha, aloha nui mai kako. Um, Ovao o Presley, ke ala nuhea amok saying uh, he kupa ke ia no ka aina ho o pula pula o papakolea ma o ahu. Um, he kumua o ke ia ma lalo o kawai hua lani, ke kula o lalo hawai i ma, ke kula nui o hawai i ma manoa. Um, yes, my name is Presley, ke ala nuhea amok saying. I am from um, Papakolea on the island of Oahu, and currently I'm an instructor of Hawaiian language at Kawai Hue Lani um, at University of Hawaii Manoa campus. Um, that's what I do for my professional work, um, my career. Um, but outside of that, currently a lot of people have been calling me the chancellor of Pu'uhulu Hulu University, which still feels a little bit awkward, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but yes, I founded Pu'uhulu Hulu University on July 21st of this year, 2019. So if any of you have been to Mauna Kea and attended classes, mahalo nui. Um, but to give some background on how I got involved in Mauna Kea, um, I think my kupuna just led me there in all honesty. Um, I arrived to Mauna Kea on July 13th. Um, a small group arrived the night previous on July 12th and I decided to come and kakoo support my fellow colleagues, my professors, my friends that I knew um, were gonna start to hold space on Mauna Kea. Uh, I just, the day prior, I was here on Maui for five weeks teaching at summer school up at a campus, up country. <laughs> You can guess where it was. Um, but I was teaching here for five weeks straight and then the next day after I finished school, I went straight to Mauna Kea because I heard the calling and I felt in my not all that it was the time for me to show up. Um, given the situation, it was summer, I just finished teaching and what else was I supposed to do not show up? I'm Hawaiian, I have a kuleana to do so. So I showed up on the 13th with the intention that I was gonna stay for five days. Um, and it ended up being 45 days straight before I went home. Um, but to give some background on Pu'uhulu Hulu, did you want that too? Um, we started Pu'uhulu Hulu University eight days after the 12th. So the 20th, I went around and decided, there were thousands of people who showed up after the kupuna got arrested, just to give some background. We went from roughly 40 people the first day, went up to 60, maybe 100, and then thousands just out of nowhere. Um, so with the large amount of people who showed up on to Mauna Kea in support, I realized this was an opportunity to start to educate the masses because one, we had people there that were interested in those types of things and two, we had educators from various backgrounds. So I originally started off with a small teach-in that I grew to a conference that grew into what I have called the university now. And we have been running Pu'uhulu Hulu University since. Free education for anyone who shows up to the Mauna and educators from, from all backgrounds. Yeah. Just add, so what, what's some of the kind of interesting uh, courses or lectures that have been up there? Because when you look at, I mean, when you look at the faces or the names of the people that have been up there, I mean, you're talking about the who-who of many different backgrounds and stuff. And so maybe you can kind of share a little bit of some of the topics and classes that have been offered at Pu'uhulu Hulu U. Okay, basically everything you can think of. Um, so my intention with the university is rewriting what education is first and foremost um, and what an educator looks like. So of course I've started off with people that I was familiar with. So colleagues, former professors, um, big name people that I noticed that was on the Mauna went up, was super maha'oi, said my name was Presley and I wanted them to teach and begged them to do that. So there have been professors from the university, Kalekoa has taught, Kekai has taught, Kahele has taught. Um, we have people from the law school, such as Ken Lawson, coming and teaching about law. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have Kupuna, who um, teach classes and talk about growing up on Mauna Kea and what it, how it's changed over time. Um, I've had um, practitioners come up teaching La'au Lapa'au Lomi classes. Um, scientists talking about climate change. Um, and then outside of just like Hawaii, we have people from all places throughout the world, people from Palestine coming and talking about the occupation there. Um, some friends from Aotearoa came over and gave talks. 
uh, Sarawa, a lot of people from Micronesia showed up from the Philippines, all over the world, people are showing up and talking about their experiences and how it can relate to Mauna Kea. And then also, I try to encourage various like types of people. So we have kupuna teaching, we have professors teaching, and then I've had days where we invited local high schools, for example, um, Navahio Colonial Pu'u, the immersion school up there. The students came on a Friday and they led classes all day long. So anything you can think of, Hawaiian language classes, art classes, history classes. People taught yoga at one point. Um, oli, mele, history, anything that people have specialties in, we're welcome. And I try to encourage everyone to understand that if you have IK in any capacity that you're an educator within yourself. Okay, Brother K. Kailo, maybe you can kind of give a, and I think for you, important kind of show maybe <clears throat> not just your personal involvement with Mauna Kea, but how does it connect perhaps with your own work in the past? I know you did some work with environmental uh, uh, education or law education, I guess, uh, and so forth. But um, how do you see yourself in your work connecting to really what's going on with Mauna Kea? You guys got a couple hours. No. Uh, um, well, let me start with a couple stories. Uh, one one was when I was a little kid. We used to go down to Wailupe and and I told this story before, I think, and, and pick owl stone for, um, for Imu. And back then, the community was still kind of close-knit. People kind of knew each other. Wailupe is Aina Haina, if you're not familiar. Um, so if you look at Aina Haina today, real, it, it's changing. Um, the complexion of the community there is changing. But when we were little, you go, you take whatever stones that you need for your emu, and you let the resource kind of replenish itself. Um, and it was no problem. Um, when I got older and started going and then taking my son, um, within about 15 minutes of going into the stream, there was usually a cop standing over the bridge looking down and saying, hey, what you guys doing down there? And from what I understood, the community that had moved in, and these houses are now worth millions of dollars, um, were not used to seeing people collecting stones out of the stream. That just was not normal for them. Um, and because they spent so much money in, in the, the home that they purchased, they expect a certain kind of thing that goes on. Like th They need peace and serenity. Uh, more than they need to see natives walking into the stream and collecting stones. And so I reflect on that because I, I look at um, Mauna Kea in, in a very similar way. Um, for a long period of time, access was occurring pretty normally, but it wasn't like the community had to go around and tell everybody, hey, I'm going Mauna Kea for prey. Or, I'm going Mauna Kea to put some kupuna to rest, or I'm going to do those type of things. It was just the practice. It was just part of the normal uh, practice of life. Uh, over time, because of the changes that are occurring, there's different expectations that are being brought into our communities. And some of those expectations are very unhealthy when it comes to maintaining your cultural integrity of a space and of a people. And so I tell that story because um, it seems to me that now we have to educate the police, educate the community, and the burden seems to be on the Hawaiian community to have to explain why we're here and why the land is so important and why the relationships that we have with the land are so important. From something as simple as collecting a few emu stones for your family emu. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of how, uh, from a talk story perspective, that's kind of how uh, I, I evolved. And then when we started um, uh, learning more things in school, you know, back, uh, my dad, who was a pretty awesome fisherman, um, you know, didn't have the fiberglass or, or fibergraph, uh, what is that, the, the graphite poles, you know, back in the day, you got bamboo poles, you, you burn them and you, what is called, allele it, so the thing is, is solid, and you, you wrap your own and you make your own ulua poles. Um, partly because you don't have money, but partly because you understand the resources available to you. And one of the things that he used to say as I started to get educated and radicalized was, oh yeah, 
I just, I just don't know that Hawaiian part of our history anymore. And, and what, what confuses me, um, what confused me, and we hear it still today, is sometimes in our community, we, we hear that, oh, I don't know that, or I don't understand that. But, we, but if we look deep enough, we understand that the way we were raised and the little things that we do is very Hawaiian. And for my dad and my mom and the family to kind of realize that over time, right, when, when, start, when all of this awakening starts to happen, is, is a beautiful thing. And so for me, getting involved in Mauna Kea had to do with being born, had to do with being exposed to things that you don't really think this is a Hawaiian practice, this is a Hawaiian way of doing things, or, you know, it's just what you do. And as you, as you start to see the awakening of our community, you realize, you know, that it not just means something, but it validates your very existence. And so, um, I don't even know if I'm answering your question, but, um, but, but then you start getting involved and you start learning. You get, you know, like for me, uh, I was um, brainwashed in law school. And so in that brainwashing, they, they taught me how to explain who I am using legal methods and legal terminology. And yeah, it works when you wanna speak to people who don't understand plain English. Um, but what's valuable about those things, and those of you who are in education now, is not that you're getting that degree and now you've learned this new language. What's valuable is that you're able to take that and reaffirm what you already knew and, what you, and who you already are. And that's what I think is what Mauna Kea has done for me and for my family and for many people. If you haven't noticed, it's kind of made a big awakening in our community, right? Um, so I'll stop there. So I just want to actually give a little background first about Mauna Kea and have them speak uh, particularly to why be involved with the protection of Mauna Kea. So let me just kind of read from a... Um, just background information on design. So first of all, Mount Nakea, of course, is the highest mountain uh, within the Hawaiian chain, yeah, 14,000 feet high. The area in which the so-called 30-meter telescope, the TMT, is proposed to be built is upon lands that is conservation lands, the highest level, in fact, of conservation lands within the so-called state of Hawaii, um, pristine lands, um, in a zone that surrounds a top which has very much high amount of Hawaiian archaeological sites. Um, for traditional Hawaiian religion and philosophy and the way we saw the sites, any high areas, in fact the highest area of all islands, were seen as being sacred or areas that were, as we would say in Hawaiian, kapu, or very restricted on how you would so-called access those areas. Uh, part of the understanding, of course, it's from those areas there we call Wawakua, areas that are so-called gods reside. And it's built upon this idea that these areas are areas that um, are sacred to life. Yeah, so when you think of the word sacred, you know, really think about the word simply. What it means is these are areas which need to be protected because they provide us life. They're life-giving in many ways. And at the top of Mauna Kea, it is, of course, the highest point. Uh, it's the highest um, watershed. Uh, in fact, you have Lake Waiau, uh, the highest lake, <laughs> uh, you know, within the Pacific area. Um, it is also the top of the watershed where the water has been collecting, of course, for a million years, perhaps. And so uh, these areas has always been places that we restrict ourselves from um, entering unless for very specific reasons and if Entering would follow particular protocols. And this is not unlike all areas. For example, if anyone grew up in Hawaii for many years, um, as little kids, I remember, you know, you didn't just would go up to the top of the mountain. You wouldn't just go up to the top of the valley. Those areas were, today they call them watersheds. You know, back then it was called, you know, there were spaces in which you realize uh, water, which, which of course is the requirement of all life, had to be protected. And of course, nobody wants to drink water where people are, swimming in or walking through. And so you would pay special attention to those areas to make sure that they would never be damaged or they would never be harmed. 
it also taught you a way of seeing the world that we have spaces that are excluded for specific reasons because we see, of course, water, as we say, water is life, that water, in fact, is the foundation of all, of all life. Um, now, with Mauna Kea, um, <clears throat> we must understand the first telescopes began in the late 1960s, uh, whereby the University of Hawaii gained a lease through the Department of Land and Natural Resources to begin building telescopes, which was after, in fact, the telescopes being built at what became called Science City on, on top of Haleakala. Um, all 13 telescopes that are on the summit of Mauna Kea at this time, I mean, there are already 13 telescopes there. None of them have ever received consent from our people in regards to being built. We must also remember that the lands in which all 13 telescopes and the TMT is proposed to be built are lands that belong to the Native Hawaiian people, lands that we have never given consent to be taken or to be used or abused, especially by uh, foreign corporations. So it's never been that Hawaiians, have, in fact, Hawaiians have always, always fought against each and every one of those telescopes. You have telescopes, in fact, where, um, I forget the name of that telescope up there, sucks. Uh, <laughs> I mean, literally, the pool or the top peak of the telescope was where the telescope sits today was, was taken off and, and destroyed and flattened. And they built the telescope right on the highest point. Um, the TMT is on lands, in fact, that are the most highly protected. Conserv These are lands that have been set aside by the state of Hawaii that says they have to be protected. And yet, let me just kind of read, if you're not clear about what the TMT is structurally, the TMT would be housed in a general purpose observatory capable of investigating a broad range of blah, blah, blah. Total diameter of the dome, now this is just the dome, the total diameter, 217 feet. The dome height, 180 feet, that's 18 stories high. Meaning, the county building we have in Wailuku, the county building, which is nine stories high, this would be twice the height of the county building that we have in Wailuku. This would be by far the highest building on the island of Hawaii, which I think is limited to eight stories or 80 feet. Uh, total area of the structure, the actual structure of the dome is 1.44 acres, but the whole complex will be a five acre complex in regards to construction on, again, conservation land. Now we must be clear, the TMT, in fact, all 13 telescopes on Mauna Kea could not be built even in downtown Hilo. So you have some kind of weird contradiction even on the state law where, whereby they call these conservation lands, but yet these are industrial uses these are buildings that are in fact higher than any other building that we have on Maui or in Hawaii which would be allowed to be built upon Mauna Kea. So you can clearly see even under so-called state laws or land use laws, there's this huge contradiction in regards to why this is being allowed to be built on conservation lands. So you have these foreign corporations who are being given basically the opportunity to construct industrial uses and a building upon lands which supposedly have been set aside to be protected so that they would not, in fact, be built in this way. And part of our argument has been, in fact, that if you can build the TMT 180 feet tall, five acre complex on conservation land, really what's that saying? All lands in Hawaii, all lands in Hawaii that's supposedly under some kind of protection are not really protected. Now add to that, of course, is that these lands are considered sacred to our people. And we have spoken out throughout decades against each and every telescope and really specifically to the TMT. We have gone through the courts. We have gone through public testimony. 
we have gone through every mechanism in which you can exercise supposedly your right of consultation to speak out in the process to stop what is going on on the summit of Mount Naked, 14,000 feet high. And what we have learned through this process, even though you may have a hundred people come out to the University of Hawaii, for example, to testify against the construction. And sometimes even 100% of the people coming out to testify against. What you find is the powers to be and the system protects these foreign industrialists. Again, let's be clear. The TMT is a foreign corporation. India, China, Japan, Canada, along with Caltech, are the TMT corporation. $1.4 billion project. UH professor recently talked about two months ago, whereby the TMT, in fact, will bring in roughly about $400 million of research a year. So you can see, for those proponents, this is really about economics and money upon lands that they don't own. And for myself personally, I just want to leave with this one story before I turn to Keala Nuhea and Ke Kailua for them to put in their two cents. When I had spoken to one of the astronomers, a proponent of the TNT, who actually came up to me and got a little discussion or debate with me. And he turned to me and he said, Kalekoa, Mauna Kea belongs to the world. And I turned to him and I said, wow. It's funny how your sickness, this holy supremacy that somehow you believe, you speak for the world. See, that's a sickness that he carries. He thinks he speaks for the world. And I asked him, how do you speak for the world? And then I asked him, and who gave Mauna Kea to the world? And I turned to him and said, how long have you been in Hawaii? Almost seven years. Almost seven years? And you believe? You can give Mauna Kea to the world? If that's not the pinnacle or the best example of the supremacist mentality, who the hell is he to come to Hawaii and then tell us lands that belong to our people which we never gave him consent over, that he is going to give Mauna Kea to the world? And he, in fact, he speaks for the world. See, my point is, Racism is so normalized in their mentality that they cannot help but to think, in fact, that they know better than us. In fact, that they have more of a kuleana to Mauna Kea than us. That they could even have the audacity to believe that they can take from us and give to the world just because. That is a sickness of domination, dominion. That is a sickness of supremacy. That is this ideology that comes from the ideas of the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny. It's the same sickness that we have over this world today. And what you find really for myself in Mauna Kea, Mauna, Mauna Kea really for us represents as our people. Almost like the final straw. Almost of the example that if we cannot protect the highest mountain, Protected on conservation lands, lands that always have belonged to our people, lands that we have never given consent. If we cannot even con protect Mauna Kea, then we will not be able to protect any other lands in Hawaii. So for me, Mauna Kea represents for our people, in a sense, the final line in the sand. Either we stand up today and we fight for Mauna Kea, because if we don't, we might as well kiss the rest of Hawaii goodbye to this corporate, greedy, international investors. Because for them, it's not about humanity, although that's what they say. And they talk about the millions of dollars that they can make and how this is for humanity. And I say, oh yeah, I can look down from Mauna Kea. I can see a lot of people living on the beaches in blue types right now. I can look out to Africa, where people don't even have clean water. 
I can look down to Papua, where people are being murdered in a genocidal campaign. You can look to Africa, with the colonial thugs that are still there, raping and pillaging those lands and peoples. And you want to talk about humanity? They don't understand that their ability, the power that they receive to do what they do is based upon settler colonialism. It's based upon the fact that they represent the wealth that have been extracted and stolen from native peoples around the world. So they're not innocent at all. They are part and central to the problem of settler colonialism that you see around the world. But you see, they hide themselves with science. Somehow wipe themselves the idea that if they're doing something scientific, they excuse themselves from that evilness and ugliness that you find in the world. And all I say, really, science is not good or bad. But science can be used for the benefit of bad. All you got to look, you can start in the Pacific. I can mention Inuatok, Rangalap, Bikini. That was scientific experiments. Fungafa, Mururoa. That's scientific experiments. That the Pacific has always been used by the so-called holy supremacists for their benefit for their creation of wealth, for their domination of the world, at the expense of who? Pacific peoples. And for us, that time is over. We no longer will accept their dehumanization. We no longer accept that we will be quiet and stand by and allow them to march down into history, to treat our people as if we're not human beings, as if we don't understand the value of places like Mount Nakea to humanity. So, and I just kind of rolling that out to uh, maybe with Kiala Anu here first. But more into the specifics of it. What is, what is it about you as a Kanaka that drives you to go out there every week, that makes you dedicate in a sense, we have to stand at this time. So what is it about Mauna Kea for you personally? And also, what would you say to other Hawaiians or even non-Kanaka out there, why they should be involved in the protection of Mauna Kea? <laughs> Okay, to be first and foremost, I want to be very clear that this is my, for me, my first like super direct action, like activist work. I've been in academia my entire life. I've been in institutions being educated and talking about these things. Everything was always talk, 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 talk. Oh, this is what Aloha Aina is. This is what it's supposed to look like, all of that. Um, and when I decided to show up on Mauna Kea this past July, again, as I explained earlier, it was the intention that I was going to be there for a couple of days and go home. Um, but something happened after those first couple of days. I don't, I can't pinpoint exactly what it was, but I think actually being in the place that I have been discussing for so long um, through this educational lens and seeing it for myself, being in the presence of Mauna Kea, um, participating in various things such as AHA, um, I don't feel like I have a choice. I don't know how to say why I choose to continue Kelano, that. Yeah, can I just ask you, can you explain yes. the AHA and stuff? I think it's a very important element in... Can I explain Yeah, I mean, what, what, what's the value of the AHA? I think people really <laughs> got to understand, like, when you go up there, to me, that is a central... It, it definitely central. is. Central, so maybe you can help explain... Um, I can explain to the best of my abilities. Um, after the Kupuna got arrested on the 17th of July, immediately following, um, AHA was established, which is a ceremony that we've been doing on the Mauna three times a day, every single day. Uh, to one, center ourselves, to remind ourselves that we are there, why we are there, um, but to like, like <laughs> help me. Um, but basically, we do AHA three times a day. And I, yeah, we, Kalekwa shows up three times a day every time he's there. I show up. Kawila is back there. He could probably talk about it later on. Um, but it's the, I guess, it's what centers us. It's the foundation. It's what's going to align us with the Mauna and our intentions of being there. Um, is that you? OK. Continue you want on. the rest of your story? Your about the why. Why are you up there? Oh, so why am I up there? Again, everybody care okay, I, again, as I was explaining, I 
don't know how to really answer this because I, I can't answer why I'm there, but I know that I won't allow myself to not be there. Um, I, to give a little bit of background, I, like I explained, I do teach at the university. So I've been flying back and forth every single week um, since school started. Anytime I'm not teaching, I'm on the Mauna. And I think it's just innately, um, as a Kanaka, we all have Kuleana and this pool. And I believe my Na'o is just telling me that this is the appropriate place for me to be here, be or not here, but if I was on the Mauna, there. Um, because I don't have a choice to do anything but that. I think that this is a pivotal movement um, at this time. And I would be very disappointed in myself if I didn't commit myself as much as I possibly could. Same question. Um, so there's, there's, some, there's stuff going on. So as far as the Mauna goes, of course, um, I have not been there as much. Um, so my role I seem to find myself playing is one that's, that's stuck in the muck at the university and on Oahu, which is not always the healthiest place to be. And I say that because I, I think from the perspective of the so-called law that, that governs us in this society, it has helped to establish and justify the, the thing that we're calling normal today. It, it, meaning that, like the example of collecting stones from the stream, um, it's, it's harder and harder for us to, to access the spaces that maybe our parents and grandparents knew or that we thought we knew. And so we're, it's becoming more finite, not because the resources aren't there, but because the access is not being ava made available because of the way the law is. And I think that's what Mauna Kea has, has uh, why it's such a, a, a critical space right now, because the law has helped to justify the, the corrupt ways of corporate investments and the government um, pigeonholing Hawaiian practices to certain kinds of times of the day or certain kinds of practices that people are used to seeing and have left everything out of the, out of the picture. And so for us, if that's the new normal, right, if the laws that are supposedly designed to protect our rights have made our rights less and less available, uh, made space less available for us to practice and have actually tried to determine what practice smells, looks, and feels, and sounds like, then what it's, what it's doing is it's basically erasing us from our existence. And so what the AHA uh, has meant for me is that it, it, uh, it recalibrates things. It tells me that there is a different kind of law in this universe and here in Hawaii. And that law has to do with the way we connect ourselves like uh, was being discussed today at, at the, uh, the protocol. Connect ourselves like a cordage to who we are, to our ancestors and to the aina that we come from. And that law, right, if you wanna call it law, that way of thinking and seeing and connecting to the world dictates that we have to be able to access and protect and give deference to our akua and the land that has been established for our existence. It's a different kind of way of looking at the world. And so, um, so the examples that we're learning from Mauna Kea and that we're learning in Waimanalo and that we're learning in Kalailoa and Kahuku is that um, the new normal, this new normal that the government expects us to live by is not healthy. It's deteriorating our souls. It's, it's uh, erasing us from existence on this earth. And so we have to re, re, uh, recalibrate. And so I'm calling it, you folks heard of open carry, right? The, the laws in the US where you can walk around open carry with the gun and all that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna get into the Second Amendment right stuff. Um, I like to think of, of what's happening in Mauna Kea, what it's doing for us is it's, 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 um, it's telling us it's okay to open carry our culture. It's okay to open carry language. It's okay to open carry our existence as Kanaka here in Hawaii. All this time, the law has been telling us under Article 12 and all those kinds of things, you have rights as Hawaiians, but you're limited to those rights. You got to get certification for those rights. You got to get the approval to access those rights. And, and my feeling is, oh, that's full of crap already. Um, what we have to start doing and what I'm learning in my own way is 
Um, and what I've learned from the AHA is it's, it, it's time to start to open carry. So you see folks flying those flags on the trucks and getting, getting ticketed on Oahu and all the other islands. Um, that's one version of open carry. What is so bad about it? What is so, um, how does that violate, uh, you know, social, our, our society and threaten our existence? It doesn't. What it does is it threatens the normal, the new normal that the government expects out of us. And when we start to open carry more and more, not just one flag, but our language, our way of accessing areas. If I jump into the stream and the 10 neighbors calling me, I'm happy now because that's 10 more than there was the week before. And they have to realize that their new normal is a sickness. Um, and was that, again, not answering Kaleko's question. You know, before I, before I give it back. Why yeah. is it important for everybody to be involved with Mount Lekia? What would you add to that? I think you kind of answered it already. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's different levels, okay? So, um, but, but part of it is just, is just um, is, is to live, right? It's a part of living. Um, by denying that part of living uh, in the practice and access to Mauna Kea and the support of, of Mauna Kea, you deny a part of yourself. And I think my parents have, have sacrificed enough of that. And my grandparents have sacrificed enough of that. Um, and I think because I'm alive and I was born and they, they raised me and I'm, and I'm still able to kind of function, um, then, then I have to take what, what they've sacrificed and, and give it back to them. And I think that's what Mauna Kea, why, why it's so critical right now. Uh, for our overall existence. Yeah. Okay, so as, as we are all, in fact, educators, I know maybe somebody in Motenia, I don't know, so a little different, but, you know, we also must be clear, as, as we are on the campus of the University of Hawaii, what is the role or connection of the University of Hawaii to the so-called TMT and the desecration of Mauna Kea? <clears throat> the University of Hawaii holds a lease, I want you to be clear, the University of Hawaii is not the landowner of the summit of Mauna Kea. They like to pretend and play as if they're the landowner, but they are just a leasee. The summit of Mauna Kea is actually managed by the Board of Land and Natural Resources for the DLNR, managing what, what today they call state lands or ceded lands. And if anybody has taken courses in Hawaiian studies, we understand whenever you hear those words ceded lands or 5F ceded lands, we should think of what? These are lands that came and belong to whom? From the Hawaiian kingdom. These are lands that we have never, I repeat, we have never given consent to be taken and used and transferred, or so-called ceded, by the Republic of Hawaii, I get, not the Hawaiian people now, the Republic of Hawaii, to then what becomes the federal government of the United States, and then incorporated through the Statehood Admissions Act, then called the 5F ceded lands. All of these lands, in fact, are either what's called government or crown lands of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Even the United States Congress in 1993, through what's called the Apology Bill, admitted, I mean, this is official US congressional language, admitted that Native Hawaiians have never given authority or transfer of title of these lands. These are lands that belong to our people that is managed in trust by the so-called state of Hawaii through the DNR, who leased these lands in the 1960s began to the University of Hawaii. The University of Hawaii therefore then started to sublease these lands to various entities around the world. So if you look at the telescopes on Mauna Kea, many of those telescopes are foreign entities like Japan and Brazil and so forth, and Canada and others. The TMT, is a subleaser from the University of Hawaii 
who leases the land from the DLNR held in trust for whom? For us. And yet we get treated somehow as if they are the landowners. Now, with the University of Hawaii recently, recently the University of Hawaii, through the Board of Regents, really showed how spineless the Board of Regents are. Where the Board of Regents are, in fact, in the process of rules that they just recently passed. They're going to put rules at the summit of Mauna Kea on how people, I wonder whose people, of course, people can access and experience Mauna Kea. Now, let's be clear. For Native Kanaka, we the Kanaka, we have never had rules imposed on us. Never, ever have we ever had rules imposed on us to tell us how we can experience whose lands? Our own lands. And yet here is the leasee. Let's be clear. This is the leasee now. We'll determine and promote rules to help for us, the actual landowners, how we can experience Mauna Kea. This is how insane the process is. And they're imposing these rules to protect whom? They're subleasers. So we must put this in perspective. Let's be clear. There is no confusion in regards who those lands belong to. The confusion has been somehow the University of Hawaii has taken on this idea that in fact, although they have been leasing, let's be clear, the lease ends in 2000, I think 2031. 2031. The supposed TMT will take 10 years to build. So you can already see their plans, in fact, as leases, is that they're going to guarantee to have the lease, supposedly, into the future. What's important for us to understand in all of this is to continue to say the truth and not be afraid to speak the truth. The University of Hawaii are pretenders. And they're pretending that somehow they own the summit of Mauna Kea. And they can pimp out Mauna Kea to the highest bidders as they wish for their benefit at our expense and our pain. The University of Hawaii also, because of its contracts that they have as a research institute, has and sees the great economic benefit to themselves. So although the University of Hawaii has somehow promoted itself, this is what they say, this is a Hawaiian place of learning. A Hawaiian place of learning. And even though in their strategic planning and all the fancy documents that the University of Hawaii promotes as being somehow this Hawaiian place of learning, you can clearly see what they're talking about is this plastic sense of what a Hawaiian is to be. This Disneyland fake prostituted Hawaiian that is supposed to be quiet, that is supposed to just accept that we are second and third class citizens within our homeland, and somehow be led to believe, although supposedly we're here to get an education, that those lands do not belong to us. He's saying, for me as educators, and there's a lot of behind the scenes, and I know Kekai has been involved in really understanding how the University of Hawaii, and really through the administration, their administration, whether it's David Lasner or the Board of Regents, who are using this sense of Hawaiianess to promote to the world that this is an indigenous serving institution. Yeah, they're serving us right up. And it's about time especially faculty, as I've been saying, the faculty. It's about time the faculty no longer lay down and accept being manipulated 
being run over and being treated as second-class citizens within our own university. And let's be clear, most of the lands that the University of Hawaii sits on are, are whose lands? These are our lands. Our lands. All people that study at the University of Hawaii are studying upon our people's lands. Lands that we have never given consent to, including the summit of Mauna Kea. So I find the University of Hawaii has a critical role in pimping out our lands, in dehumanizing us by saying one thing and treating us another way. But even more, as even I look at the administrators, whether David Lazar or BR, I'm going to just be clear here. I'm also upset and pointing the fingers at many of the so-called, and these are so-called Hawaiians, who are in these positions of power within the administration, who are failing our people, who are bending down and accepting that we are just tokens and toys and decorations for the University of Hawaii. The University of Hawaii is rotten with racism. It has always been. All you got to look at the history. You can look at, I can start with Mokapu, where over 3,000 set of Hawaiian remains were dug up for Mokapu and Oahu. By whom? By the University of Hawaii Anthropology Department. You can talk about Porteus, if you ever read about Porteus, social scientist, entrenched with racism. He was such a great racist, they even named a building after him for some time until his name was removed. But the University of Hawaii has always taken the position of protecting Haole supremacy in these islands. It always has. No difference today. Who are they serving? The TMT Corporation? Who are we? Who are we? We're the people of this land. And yet we still get treated as if it doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter that 90% of the testimonies can say one thing. It doesn't matter because the border regions, again, who are spineless, would even consider that they will put for the first time regulations upon our people and how we access our own lands, lands that they don't even own. So I'm going to maybe go back with Kekai this time and go, Kiala Anu here. Because I know Kekai has been doing some work in challenging administration. And we can talk about uh, some of the professors in STEM and some of the issues. But I think it's important that we no longer be quiet. This is not something we should hide in the back rooms. And I, one of the things I always say too, the stench of racism is stink. Their ass smells. And we as Kanaka, our job is to point it out. Their ass stinks. But it's not our job to clean up their ass for themselves. See, the University of Hawaii must be responsible for themselves if they believe in equality and justice. If they believe this is a Hawaiian place of learning, they must take those steps to correct those injustices and deal with the racism that exists in these islands at the University of Hawaii. So let me pass on to Brother Kekai first, and maybe I know you have a lot of work in this, and, yeah. and then we can move to Kealanu here. Well, what he says is true, and the establishment of the University of Hawaii, uh, it, its foundation uh, was built on a lot of those racist ideas. And so over time, there has been uh, efforts now and then to try and, and for a lot of people just to, to you know, temper the racism. Uh, Haunani K. Trask was one of the ones who actually called it right in its face and if you folks remember she got she got blasted for it and we were we we're undergraduate students at the time um what mauna kea has done is it's um it's taken that racism that uh since the 1980s that's kind of been existing kind of behind the scenes and it's brought it back to the forefront and if you folks that remember the guy that was on tv uh learned who, um, who made those racist remarks in a public forum. Um, and what, what he was doing was, was saying what was being discussed in a university uh, email listserv. And, the, and it had been discussed for more than a year uh, and by more than just Professor Learned. In fact, the president of the university was on that listserv 
while he was saying what he said. Now, somewhere along the line, one of the Hawaiian professors in, science, in the sciences told the, told the university administration, this is not right, you gotta say something. So the university said, let's be, let's be kind to each other. You know, and he, he, he said, this kind of stuff shouldn't go on. But up until that point, nothing. Until a Hawaiian professor had to come out and say, this isn't right. The other professors there actually chimed in to the racist comments. Okay, so, so that was going on. It's like not, not like it didn't exist. Um, but for some reason, because of this Mauna Kea issue, that faction of people who supported, now let's be clear, the ones who actually supported TMT seemed to be the ones that felt justified in raising those kinds of racialized, discriminatory comments in these listservs. These are University of Hawaii public listservs now. This is not just the, what they're trying to say is, oh, this is just between me and my friends. No, no, no. This was a public listserv with more than just them and their friends. It was all of the science community who, who wanted to be a part of it and our UH administration. And so when that one professor got up, Summer Mauna Kea, and said, hey, that's not right. You need to stop saying that. She got blasted for it. And the university, she actually told the university administration first before she went public. And the administration, this is honest truth now. When I sat with them, uh, I was one of the advocates, uh, sat with the administration, and administration said, there's nothing we can do about it. Kind of made it sound like free speech. And that kind of blew our minds. Nothing you can do about a senior tenured faculty telling a Hawaiian woman, non-tenured, brand new, this is her first semester in the, in the university, telling this, this person, this young, uh, uh, this, this tenured, uh, non-tenured Hawaiian faculty, racist comments about her, her school, and the, the point of view that she holds. There's nothing they can do about that. So what does that tell you, right? It kind of echoes what Kaleko was saying. Um, it's not until she went to the news and said, look, I'm concerned, not just about me, but about every other Hawaiian who happens to have a point of view that's contrary to the pro TMT guys. Are we all going to be subjected now to racialized attacks um, and not have any kind of you know, healthy dialogue? And is the university administration going to ignore it? And when she finally came out and said it, the university said, oh, we need to talk to the Kamehameha schools, we need to talk to the guy who said it, but they, uh, they didn't turn and come to the Hawaiian community on campus who was directly affected, didn't talk to the students to tell us they were concerned or, or that it wouldn't happen again. It was, it was very uh, troubling, okay? So this is um, just part of it, and I don't wanna get into too much of the, the weeds about it, but it's important to recognize that in the university system, we have to be courageous. We have to be, because no one else is gonna speak for us. And that's the example that we got from the University of Hawaii administration. And one of the things that um, is required, and Kaleko kind of made, made, a, made a call out to, to our other administrators. One of the things that I think is critical for us is not to play the game, but to to uh, speak truth to uh, to the uh, speak speak to the kinds of issues that the university has been ignoring for quite a long time, TMT has brought that out, brought a lot of the ugliness out in a lot of the folks. Okay, I'm going to keep going then. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> As an educator. As an edu. I'd like to remind you, I do not have tenure. <laughs> Be careful what you say. But as an educator, what's major term? What about the? Um, I know. I know you worked with some of the. Uh, sorry. Worked with the. Uh, maybe you can explain some of that work with the students, who are um, in the administration's building or something, and and maybe just kind of give some background to that also maybe, and your work with them and, and all of that. So. Okay. Again, I'm not tenured, so I've got to be very, very careful with how I approach this topic. Um, I am not directly involved with um, Kia Ike Kahokani, but there are a group of students who have occupied space at UH Manoa campus um, in Bachman Hall since the start of this semester until UH decides to 
um, stop supporting TMT. I have visited them quite a bit, um, but I am not directly involved with what they are doing. Um, you want me to just talk about that? Education. Um, okay, for me as an individual, I, um, I'm seeing how students within the university system are stepping up into these roles, and it makes me very, very proud. A lot of these students are former students of my myself, which is crazy, um, and students that I have currently, um, which have been dedicating all of their free time, a lot of their resources, um, their health by being in those spaces. Um, it just makes me really proud. A lot of them do come up to the Mauna quite frequently as well. And as an educator, it um, again, I'm very young with an education as well. I'm young with an, I'm young just in all general. I'm like this baby activist, baby educator. Um, like cool that I have some students that are doing these things now as well. Um, but it makes me really proud to see that they're stepping up because at the same time, I feel like I'm learning and growing with them as well. Um, and we're doing this together. So it's just kind of cool to see these different generations. I guess I'm older than the students in school now. Um, but these new <laughs> medium, um, these newer um, students stepping up and filling these roles that just 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, I was trying to do at their age and they're like surpassing what I was able to do. Um, but again, that's about as much as I'm gonna comment in regards to UH. I just wanna, I mean, it sounds, we kinda laugh because we know it's, it's, a, it's a UH politics thing, right? But one of the things that they do at the university system is they, they give professors tenure, right? You folks are familiar with that, right? And the tenure does a, does a couple of things. Well, one big one is, it provides for the professor the ability to, to engage in, in their research, to engage in all kinds of things, to have a certain level of freedom without reprisal, right? Um, that, so when you hear people saying, well, I'm not tenured yet, or I'm not in a tenure position, that should be concerning for all of us because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that we're not tenured and therefore we cannot speak, and therefore we cannot express our ideas in a very healthy way. Because otherwise, what's the point of us being here at the university? Why are we here? If, if, I mean, if you folks wanna just come to my class and have me dictate to you what you should know, and then you go take an exam and you go, okay, I know Kekai stuff, I'm smarter. Um, then, then you're missing the point, right? The point is to engage. The point is to develop your own understanding of the world and utilize the resources that are there in order to do that. But if I feel like I cannot express myself as your teacher, then what are you getting from me, really? You can just read the book. You don't need me, right? So the university is supposed to be a space where we can engage each other. And if the university is telling us that you should be concerned about expressing yourself, then we've got a problem for our students, for our teachers, and for our administration. And one of the things that we t took to the, uh, the Board of Regents two months ago was we told them, look, we are hearing now that professors, especially non-tenured ones, who are expressing support for the Kia Ion Mauna Kea, we're hearing that they might get treated differently when it comes to getting reviewed for tenure. We're hearing that Hawaiian Studies Department may or may not, I mean, this is all kind of this, this rumor mill stuff that's going around, suggestions that are being made, that Hawaiian Studies Department might not get the kind of administrative funds that they need to run their department. So we told the Board of Regents, hey, there's a problem there. We need to address it. And there was basically silence. And we finally got to meet with uh, the chair of the, of, the, uh, of the Board of Regents, who took it under advisement. The quiet means that nothing else has happened. Um, and and so, so what do we do? So why is Mauna Kea so important? Well, based on everything that has been said over here, we know why. But what does it translate now to our everyday kind of things as students, as community members, as teachers at the university or in classrooms, as people working in private industry? It tells us that there are certain things that can be said and certain things that shouldn't be said because if you do say it, you might find yourself 
in a very precarious situation. And I think what Kalekoa was, was mentioning earlier and what um, Keala Anuhea was saying, sorry, um, is important, is that you, at some point, we have to be willing to accept the kinds of oppression that's going to occur. Otherwise, we're back to square one. We're back to sacrificing the things that our grandparents and parents had sacrificed before. And the time, we're done with that already. We're done. Yeah. Um, the last thing I kind of wanted to get into is, uh, before we ask, open to questions, is kind of get into the question of kapu aloha as a practice. And um, but before I get there, I just kind of wanted to remind ourselves, you know, as the great Frederick Douglass said, if there's no struggle, there's no, where's my students? There's no struggle, yeah, there's no progress. The University of Hawaii represents the powers to be in Hawaii. They're directly aligned with those who have operated in a way that have gained wealth for those who benefit off of the oppression of our people and the alienation of our people from our own lands for far too long. And so when I hear certain members, for example, the Board of Regents, talk about the crisis of Mauna Kea, I find it interesting when they say crisis, as if there's something wrong going on. See, for me, it's not a crisis for Kanaka. It's a crisis for those who benefit for far too long of our oppression and dehumanization. It's a crisis for them. Because the sounds that I hear from Mauna Kea, when I watch every day and I see our people in the aha dancing on the ala nui, presenting ourselves in the best Hawaiian kanaka way that we can today, it's not a crisis. It's the sound of the chains of our brains that are breaking. That's a crisis for them. That's the sound of liberation for us. And so for me, it's not something that I am afraid of at all. I understand this is a process of our people getting off our knees and beginning to stand and speak for the first time in many generations. Yes, should they be, out, should they be fearful? You bet they'll call it, they should be fearful. Because we no longer are gonna be quiet. We no longer will tolerate being dehumanized and treated as if we're not a real people. And the things that I've said over and over in all of this, Mauna Kea represents, and the struggle of Mauna Kea represents progress for our people. It is our people who are standing and refusing, as like Brother Kekai said, what do you call the sidearm, the... Um, no longer hiding what it is to be Kanaka. See, Kapoloha first demands that we be truthful and honest. That we not be ashamed. That we not cower. That we must first challenge that power is to be. And we do it through aloha. Which means, as my good friend Haliloha says, power through humility. Not through violence, but presenting ourselves in the best way in which we refuse to lower our standards of humanity. To allow those foreign entities, their ability to benefit of our oppression. See, those days are over. So should the Board of Regents be nervous? Yes. Why have they passed those kinds of rules? Because they are afraid. That's why they got to make rules for you Hawaiians. That's why when we showed up on, J on J July 13th, wait, not July 13th, July 12th, I should say, which is a Friday at Puhulu Hulu. That is why people don't realize we didn't stop the road. The road was closed when we got there. The road was closed by the governor of Hawaii, David Ige, who closed the road. For the first time, the Mauna Kea access was road was closed. Now let's be clear. Not closed for everybody, but closed off to who? 
to Hawaiians. You don't think we live in an apartheid system in Hawaii? You fools. The only people that are kept from accessing Mauna Kea Access Road to the top of the summit are native Hawaiians. Roads that sit upon our own lands. Roads that take us to our own lands. This is the first time in our history as a people ever that we are being restricted and regulated on how we can be Hawaiian upon our own lands at Mauna Kea. But see, we, we understand this, as I say. If the oppressors are not doing nothing to you, that means you're, doing, you're not doing anything. But if your oppressors are doing something to you, that tells you, you must be doing something right. See, that's a reactionary activity that they're doing because of fear of the people. They fear us, and so what do they do? They block us, keep us. So when we took the gate on the 15th, when the Kupuna line was set for the first time on the 15th, all in Kapu Aloha, it was done upon a road that had already been closed. We have no choice. We have no choice but to struggle. See, that's the point. We cannot accept Governor Ige, the state of Hawaii, President Lasner, the Board of Regents, to continue to dehumanize us in this way. We have no choice but to do what is necessary to maintain our dignity our integrity, our humanity. So that is why we have been there holding the Mauna Kea Access Road that we have already renamed Kealohulu Kupuna in honor of those 30, somewhat 37 Kupuna that were arrested on July 15th, no, July 18th. 18th, right? 17th. Mahalo. Got to talk to the Chancellor. Should know the information. Think about this. The state of Hawaii actually arrested Kupuna. In fact, one was in her 90s in wheelchair. Three had to be taken away by ambulance. Because they stood up for what is right for our people. But think about that. As I have keep on saying, that only shows their weakness. That only shows Ige's inability to govern. That when they got to resort to arresting Kupuna, I don't have to go to court to argue who's right or wrong. Any human being who's a real human being can look at that and understand something is rotten in Hawaii. When the powers to be will work for foreign entities, and arrest 30 somewhat kupuna. Kupuna that remain there to this day. You have kupuna who have never left. Who will give their life as they said. Who will give their life. For the protection of our right to exist as a people. So we're not playing around. This is in a game. And what you see happening every day on that ala nui. Led by some of the most important cultural figures. Of our people who come there every day to lead us in ceremony and dance. Well, I have watched, and I always tell this story. I had watched on this ala nui where little children come up. Followed by practitioners and healers who will come up in ceremony. And then one day, I remember it was Labor Day. You had a couple of, I guess you would call them Hawaiian motorcycle gangs that showed up. With their colors. And they do protocol and ceremony. And they're on the Ala Nui and they're dancing along. Many for the first time, as they told me, for the first time ever expressing themselves as a Hawaiian. See, that's the power. That is what's going on on Mauna Kea. If the state of Hawaii, Ige, and all of those fools somehow believe that somehow we're going to water ourselves down and we're going to quiet down, I'm sorry. Yes, it's a crisis for them. It's a crisis for these investors. It's a crisis for all those who still think, for example, they can continue to divert our waters. 
It's a crisis for those industrial agriculturalists like Monsanto, which have just shown, like we've been saying, had been poisoning our people. It's a crisis for them. It's a crisis for those people who want to put the largest windmills in the so-called United States at the detriment of the health of the people of Kahuku. Yeah, it's a crisis for them. Because we will no longer accept being treated as if our voices don't matter. So what you see going on in Mauna Kea is a ripple effect throughout all of Hawaii. And I would say it's a ripple effect that's going worldwide. I have met people from all over the world. We have been sent images of uh, so-called natives in the Amazon with the kukia'i symbol, in Papua, in Palestine, all over the world. They understand what's going on here. So for me, there is no turning back. There is no cowering again. There is no going back into the closet as a Hawaiian. And I invite non-Hawaiians to stand with us, as you find many in Mauna Kea. In fact, there are some of them who have been there from the beginning. And there's a role for everybody. Now with Kapu Aloha, Kapu Aloha for me has been the key to all of this. Kapu Aloha is not how we just deal with law enforcement, or the state of Hawaii, or the supposed National Guard. Kapu Aloha is really more important than how we deal with one another how we truthfully speak to one another, how we see that we are, in fact, all in this together. So it's really, in a Hawaiian sense, a kako thing. And for me, this is the, since the overthrow of the Hawaiian land, this is the greatest mobilization of our people through the ideology of Aloha Aina. As I always say, Aloha Aina world order. It's time for a new world order, one based upon Aloha Aina. And the practice of kapu aloha is something you can experience up there firsthand. And for our people, when people talk about kapu, it's not like you got to teach people kapu aloha. It's built within us for generations. It's part of our DNA. It's part of the land we live on. It's part of the water we drink. It's part of the rain that falls upon our head. This love for the land. The way of treating each other in a human way as best as possible. And I know I preached on too much. But I kind of wanted to ask, you know, Kekai and Kala Nohea as a last kind of question. What, is you, what do you guys see as being cup, the value of kapuloa as a practice, as a way of organizing, a way of expressing ourselves on the mauna? One of you can go first. Kala I mean, kind of go a little bit too winded, but, you know. The moderator. Go ahead. Amen. Moderating. Oh, man. Oh. Um, kapuloa is difficult sometimes. Not gonna lie, especially for people like me. Um, <coughs> but Kapu Aloha is what's keeping everything grounded. And I've, before going to the Mauna, I've gotten into conversations with people about what is Kapu Aloha? Where did this come from? Like, is this a made up thing that we just suddenly created in 2015 when things were happening on the Mauna? Um, the term itself, I believe, is new, but the concept is not. Um, whenever I think about Kapu Aloha, I think about um, things that our kupuna have done in the past are, for example, like Lili'u Okalani, right? What she did for her people, that was very much kapu aloha. Um, being on the mauna, I have to constantly reflect on myself within how I am expressing or lacking kapu aloha sometimes. Um, but kapu aloha has helped me to be, an, I think, a better person in general. Um, on the mauna, it helps to keep our focus because if you're constantly thinking about kapu aloha and maintaining this kapu aloha, then you are driven to remember why you are there. The, the whole purpose of you being there is what to protect mauna kea, um, to protect our aina in general and to perpetuate aloha aina. Um, and if you don't worry about these outside influences and how little things bother you, um, and Kapu Aloha will help you to stop thinking and focusing on those things, then we're able to maintain um, what is necessary for us to hold on and to continue on. Um, so Kapu Aloha has been pretty much everything. It's just Aloha in general for me. Um, and understanding who I am as a Hawaiian, as a Kanaka, and who I'm supposed to be and how to better myself for not just myself, but my Lahui in general. 
I have um, aloha for our, I got to thank our, our Mauna Kea Kia'i because um, what they've done is they've helped to, to refashion and set a, another powerful cornerstone for the foundation of our Lahui with Kapu Aloha. And not just through intellectual processes, but actual practice. And so um, from a practical point of view, uh, it, it's different than what we experienced in, in the 80s uh, when we were getting arrested, when, you know, we, it's not, it's not nonviolent political practice, right? I mean, that, that's a very Western term. And nonviolent political practice has all of these methodologies that you would you'd engage in. But Kapuloha is beyond that. And, and, and it is so much more empowering that everything that I could think of when we were getting arrested back in the 80s was... Uh, was I mean back then it was like okay we committed to nonviolence but anybody touch brother clay fuck that I'm gonna oh sorry sorry camera I was good up until this point um, the heck with that bro we're not gonna let that happen you know so so it's like okay well you know that's not quite nonviolent political alternatives Kapula is way different and and it starts with acknowledging your humanity and the humanity of the people around you and so uh, so it, it has become such a valuable foundation for me and you know so look around us right look at look at how uh when we were getting ar arrested in the 80s my family would go oh shame you gotta watch out you know don't do this don't do that now they're calling me up like when you going up next Be and not just because it's a real popular thing but they they see the value of kapu aloha they see how it brings a community together they see how it builds relationships they see how truth comes out of it. And so they're, they're recognizing that and they're recognizing their self, their, their cultural and spiritual connection. And, they, and, and so, at least from my family's point of view, it's like, it's time. It's time. Um, so when, you, when you're engaging with people, uh, you know, like when we engage with the university or the, the governor's office, and they go, yeah, but, that's not, that, they, they've lost it. They've lost the translation. When they're able to go, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but then they're not getting it. Right? They're not understanding. They haven't embraced Kapu Aloha. They haven't, they haven't given themselves up to another way of seeing beauty and love in this world because they have to hold on to that thing that gives them, I don't know, that gives them their power. And so our role, I think, at some point is to keep reminding them that what they're holding on to is not sustainable. Uh, when the university tells us, uh, I was reminded today, the University of Hawaii president met with the university represent, Hawaiian university representatives and said, I support your protests. In fact, I feel like I should protest. That's not the point. If, if we didn't have to protest, I don't think we would, right? But why are we protesting? It's already been said, right? And, and, and so the yeah, but means that they need more work. Now, Kapuolo helps me to be more patient and go, okay, maybe I'll put a little bit more effort into, into that. Because otherwise, it'd be F you, brah, right? Um, and so that's, that's just generally, uh, I think, where where it's happened, and, and I think it touches us a little bit differently depending where you are and who you are, but absolutely, it is a cornerstone. It is a foundation, a foundation that empowers, and when you see that, all of these other things that we consider normal, we can now look at and go, no, it's not. We're done. I keep, that's kind of my theme today, right? Um, um, brother, go ahead. Just um, invite everybody to our side if you haven't been convinced yet. As I say, if you look on our side, we get some pretty cool people. You know, we have the, as I said, the hallmarks, the cornerstones of Hawaiian culture. You know, Antipua, Kanahe, and the whole gang. Um, some of the, you know, I mean, these are the cornerstones of the Mary Moloch that are on the Mauna. We got the rock. Jason Momoa, 
Nicole Schwitzinger, now we just got Janet Jackson. I mean, who does Ige have? My point is, this is larger. This is larger than just one telescope, you see. And although they always say, you know, the Hawaiians are making this a lot bigger than, you know, as if they're somehow innocent. No. They're the point of this spear. That what you see going on in a community is a lot larger. It's, and I, I, I keep on saying this. What we are fighting for right now is for the heart and soul of the future of Hawaii. The heart and soul of the future of Hawaii is on the line. Are we going to remain this playground of militarism, foreign investment, and these corporations for them to dictate our lives in the future? Or is Hawaii going to become really the promise of aloha? This place where I think the rest of the world one day will follow and become like. Because to me, that's what's really on the line here. Because if the TMT, as I said, is allowed to start construction, they will know, they will know no peace. They will never know any peace. We will not disappear. And all you got to look into what's going on in Hawaii. All the various struggles that is going on. And I invite all of us to be involved. As the great George Helm said, first of all, do your homework. Do your homework. Do your homework. Get educated. But get involved. Don't stand on the sidelines and allow those who have run Hawaii for too long, run amok to continue to decimate this place. That we have to become the subjects of our own history. That we must step forward, educate ourselves, organize ourselves, and do whatever is necessary. Not for just us, but think about the benefit of our grandchildren to come. What Hawaii will we leave? When you look at what's going around, look at what's going on in the world. I just was watching CNN today, I guess. I watch every morning. And I was like, oh, my God. They're talking about in, uh, shucks, where were they? In Europe. And the amount of glaciers that are disappearing at an alarmed rate. Global warming is destroying this world. And let's be clear. Who caused global warming? I want you guys to think about this now. It's bad science. It's those bad, greedy scientists who created global warming, allowing those kind of projects and greed to manipulate the environment in ways so they can fatten their pocket. See, science is not good or bad, but we got to be careful how we use science as people. As the great Gandhi said, one of the seven sins, in fact, is science without humanity. At all costs, science should be for humanity. And not for the benefit of a few. Not so as one Craig Foltz from the National Science Foundation, the Solar Observatory, told me that his research was just, just pure selfish research. And I challenge the science world. And I challenge students and faculty to so think about how we, as educators, can promote a more just, equitable, and shit, a better planet to leave for our children. Not this horror that's coming down the line. And when they talk about using telescopes so they can look, so they can move on to another star, I mean, think about that craziness. They don't can even take care of the earth. And they're talking about going off to some... You think they're going to take us along on that trip? No. So we all have a kuleana. Faculty, community, and students. We all have a kuleana to work for what's betterment in Hawaii. And to say that people of Hawaii, first of all, have a right to determine for themselves a better Hawaii. And so with that, I'm just going to ask any last comments. Maybe you want to throw in there. Kealanu here. Kekai. To our community? Uh, culture is never static. Right? Culture is never static. 
we, we, we adjust to the, to the things that are occurring around us day to day. And unfortunately, because of the, the new normal of oppression that's going on in Hawaii, the culture of being a Hawaiian means that you must protest, that you must resist. So resistance, and this has been said on the Mauna, and it's, I'm going to say it today again, resistance now has become part of a cultural practice in order to be able to survive and have that cultural practice move on. So when we leave this forum and have our other discussions, it's always important to remember when you see people protesting in every island, it's important to start to shift the way we look at that protest and understand that when Hawaiians are fighting for water, access, land, mauna, that is part of their cultural practice now. And we can thank the University of Hawaii, and we can thank the governors, past and present, and we can thank the, the, the legal leaders in the state of Hawaii, and the Supreme Court, and all of the court-appointed people for helping develop that process. Because had it not been for their corrupt way of looking at the world, this would not be necessary. Mahalo. Um, i just like to close by um, saying first and foremost, mahalo for um, coming and listening. But also, um, if you feel the call to go to Mauna Kea, um, please do. And if you'd like to teach at Pu'uhululu University, I'm always looking for educators. So hit me up. Oh, okay, Kai wants to talk again. What? <laughs> No, 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 that's, that's literally all I wanted to say. I just wanted to um, thank Maui College. Um, I should have said this in the beginning. Uh, I'm very humbled to, to actually be asked to be here. It's believe it or not, I've been in the university for almost 20 years, and this is the first time I've been invited to speak at a Kuoko'o event. You don't have a friend over there. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> um, so, so I love you guys for, for, for doing that, um, and I'm very humbled to be here, and mahalo nui.